All right, everyone, let's get started. So um, the Center for Indigenous Science is a partnership between American Indian Studies and the Carl R. Rose Institute for Genomic Biology and is a space on campus that highlights indigenous epistemologies, values, and practices. Uh, the center uses frameworks that are collaborative, community-based, and inclusive to address questions of importance to indigenous peoples. Uh, the center provides a welcoming environment for indigenous scholars and scientists and amplifies indigenous voices in STEM and beyond. Uh, in this spirit, I'll read our university land grant. Uh, we would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Oya, Miami, Muscoutin, Adawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. Uh, these lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggle for survival and identity. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge these peoples, the peoples of these lands as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of the institution for the past 150 years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that the university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of Native peoples is a start as we move forward for the next 150 years. And so I'm honored that one of our first Center for Indigenous Science speakers is Dr. Katrina Claw. Uh, Dr. Claw received her PhD from the University of Washington in Genomic Sciences uh, and then continued to do a postdoc there in pharmacogenomics and bioethics, working with the Northwest Alaska Pharmacogenomics Research Network, the South Central Foundation, and the Navajo Nation. Uh, Dr. Claw has published in journals such as Frontiers in Genetics, American Journal of Bioethics, uh, Science, Nature Communications, to name a few. Uh, and who's received multiple awards, including the NHGRI Genomics Innovator Award uh, and the Gabriel W. Lasker Award. Uh, on a more personal note, I first got to know Katrina uh, right here in this room as she was part of the inaugural SING program in 2011. Uh, her work has been an inspiration and model of how to do research for me and my lab. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Katrina Clough. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Uh, great. Well, thank you for that introduction, Ripin. It's uh, my honor to be here today, and thank you so much for inviting me, and also to Dr. Jenny Davis for uh, inviting me as well. I'm very honored to be here today and um, uh, be back in familiar settings, um, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself in my language. Um, so, Yat e she Katrina Tla Yanishia, Tuahana Nishle, Deschitni Bashishin, Twitch Ini Deshache, but Ani Deshanella. So, this is, I just stated my four clans. Um, my first clan is um, the near the water clan, and that's how I uh, situate myself as a Navajo woman. Um, so, Today I was lucky enough to meet another two other Navajo people and we were able to t tell each other our plans and uh, share our relationships with each other. Um, so with that, I'm very honored to be here. Um, today I will be talking about indigenizing pharmacogenomics and the sciences and some of the various uh, approaches I've taken um, to do so. Um, and this is just a uh, picture of the campus I'm at. Let me double check if this works. Okay, yeah. So this is the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, which is actually based in Aurora, Colorado. But if you look right here, this is actually downtown Denver, so we're not very f far away from each other. But in here, uh, so my lab space is in this building here, which is the Research 2 building. Um, and then here we do have an, a Native American center as well for health. Um, I always forget the whole acronym, Center for American Indian Health and Research. Um, so this is where I'm coming from, and um, okay, great. Uh, actually, I might stand on this side. <laughs> so this is an overview of my uh, talk today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about indigenous science and my uh, approaches to it. Um, I will uh, share my pos pos positionality and motivations for the research that I do. 
and then I will talk about how I approach indigenizing the sciences, uh, specifically pharmacogenomics, and then I'll talk about a new program that uh, me and my colleagues are implementing at University of Colorado and more broadly uh, around the US, and then uh, ending with some uh, future directions. Um, so I want to start with, start with this, that indigenous people have always been scientists. Um, we don't call ourselves scientists, and for many, they would not, uh, um, they would not describe themselves as scientists, but um, I think that a lot of the practices around the world, so this is just showing a photo of Aboriginal indigenous peoples in Australia using fire to uh, control and uh, sustain their environments, and then this is a picture from Peru, which uh, is where the many different varieties of potato have been domesticated over time. And these were not just happenstance uh, coincidences that happened. These were intentional processes that indigenous people have Im implemented because of knowledge of their environment. So when I think about science, this is where I'm coming from uh, as an indigenous person. Um, and there are multiple ways of knowing. I think that we say indigenous science, but this is also referring to traditional knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge. There are various ways of describing indigenous science um, um, in academia, but also various ways that uh, communities describe it as well. Um, so much of this knowledge is passed on through various ways. Um, I think in the Academy, we're used to reading things or attending lectures and seminars, but um, a lot of times uh, in indigenous communities, these are or either orally transmitted or written knowledge. Um, these are embedded in ceremon ceremonial practices and different beliefs. Um, and this is a way um, that our knowledge from our ancestor is passed on from generation to generation. Um, so it's this process that of passing on knowledge as well as um, thinking about our relationships with the environment is what I think of when I think of uh, indigenous science. It's a very rigorous process that is not often acknowledged in Western academia, but has very deep roots in our communities. Um, and often is overshadowed by Western science. Um, so it was my uh, honor to really be a part of thinking about indigenous science um, in this uh, publication from Human Biology in which we, I was the co-editor for this uh, in addition to Dr. Crystal Sosi, uh, but we um, invited scholars from many different fields to submit uh, papers related to indigen indigenous science and we ended up publishing, um, I think we had to separate it into two issues actually. Um, one focused really on the biological sciences and the other focused on a lot of the environmental uh, environmental indigenous science. Um, so these are freely available. Um, this was um, published in 2019, but was really a really good collaboration and something that got me started into thinking more about how I can implement this in, in my research program and, and in a more formal way. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background. I, I'm Dana, so I'm uh, an enrolled citizen of the Navajo Nation, which is this blob right here in the middle of uh, the Four Corners area. I grew up actually right in the center. We're called the Central Agency, so right there um, in the Arizona portion. Um, and just a little bit about my background. Um, I went to my undergraduate at Arizona State University, um, which a lot of my work was in um, anthropology or biological anthropology, which is uh, how I got to know Ripon actually back in the day. And then I moved to University of Colorado where I had the opportunity to uh, really uh, work within the evolutionary genomics field, but also um, decided to switch into pharmacogenomics um, a as a postdoc and work with the Northwest Alaska Pharmacogenomic Research Network. Um, which was a really great experience because it was a place where I was able to do genomics, but also uh, with the NWA PGRN, the mission was surrounding, uh, or the, at its core was creating community connections. So we worked with uh, uh, three different tribal communities in Montana as well as in Alaska.
Um, so that framed a lot of my research program now. Uh, so in 2019, I moved to Colorado to start a research program in the Center for Personalized Medicine. Um, and I'm in the biomedical informatics program, but um, also t uh, train students with the human medical genetics and genomics program, as well as uh, in the, what's the other program? Biomedical sciences program. Um, so uh, just how did I find my passion in research? I think this goes back to sort of the uh, uh, indigenous, uh, my indigenous perspective. A lot of times we enter programs and are pushed in many different directions, but um, I found a path that felt right to me and it seemed that a lot of different factors were happening at the right time and the right place and I met the right people to uh, to uh, move me forward in this field and really excite me. So, and I, I love working in the lab and analyzing data, so that has always been my passion. Um, and as I mentioned in my postdoctoral training, I wanted to really focus on questions that mattered not only to my community, but more broadly indigenous communities. Um, so I wanted to focus on pharmacogenomics uh, because that had a more direct impact on my community. And as I started working in genomics, um, a lot of different bioethical issues and concern, concerns arose with the communities that I was working with, but also more broadly um, related to genomics. So that also became a big important part um, and community engagement. Um, and uh, a lot of the things that really mattered to Native communities was really bringing some of these genomic virtues direct into the clinic, and um, that was something that I wanted to focus on in the future. And also, um, I think that I'll, I won't touch on this a lot, but in pharmacogenomics, we're looking at drug metabolism and thing, seeing about, uh, how drugs interact, but a lot of these um, drugs that we use today and medication were derived from traditional medicines in a lot of indigenous communities. So that was also something that drew me uh, to this field. Um, and then I did want to uh, highlight that um, we are definitely uh, navigating an unequal playing field in STEM. I think that there are great sacrifices that students, underrepresented, underrepresented students and indigenous students make when they decide to pursue higher education. Um, this is, despite this being a very privileged experience uh, for me, and, um, but uh, you're away from home and your family, your culture, your language and traditions. Um, there's a lot of emotional distress. I think that everyone can probably uh, uh, sympathize with uh, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, loneliness, pressure. And then there are also unequal training networks um, uh, and expectations of, of uh, underrepresented scholars. Um, and this doesn't really change as you progress in your field. I still deal with all, all of these issues and it's often ignored or not highlighted in a lot of venues. So I think that this is important to acknowledge as we go forward. And part of my motivations for uh, establishing my own research program and becoming a principal investigator was to really change the narrative of the academy. Um, so my research program now is motivated by these three um, uh, uh, concepts of supporting equity and diversity of diverse populations in genomic research, um, addressing disparities in health and healthcare, and also enhancing ethical research with indigenous and other historically underrepresented uh, communities. So in genomics, um, this is a real-time uh, genome-wide association study participant monitor, uh, and you can go on at any day. I think I I don't remember. Oh, this was from January of last year. So um, I don't think the numbers have changed very much, but what's striking is that 95% of GWAS studies um, only involve European descent populations and all the other populations are quite low. I think the last I checked for indigenous uh, representation in this was 0.05%, so less than 1% of studies involve uh, native populations. And there are many reasons behind this, and um, so a part of my motivations is uh, making this, le or changing this figure here and increasing the other parts of uh, 
participation and inclusion. So why is this important? I think that in the field of indigenous genomics, um, indigenous populations um, have really moved forward a lot of the uh, work in looking at different um, uh, genes and uh, uh, diseases and, and often this is because uh, people are looking, uh, when they look at smaller populations, they're able to look at variation that is not typically highlighted in more general populations. So all of these different conditions and characteristics have been, we've been able to make progress in identifying genetic loci responsible for like lactase, in, lactase persistence and um, high fat diets uh, by including indigenous peoples in many of these studies. Um, but also to give this a little context, um, so I am from the Navajo Nation community and um, we actually have a moratorium on genetic research. So even as a trained uh, genome scientist, I cannot go back to my community to do any genetic studies. Um, this moratorium, our ban on genetic research was put in place in 2002 and this was because of different concerns from the Navajo people about um, the lack of policies related to uh, genomic data and also the lack of experts in this area. So in 2002, right around when I started my undergraduate education, um, this moratorium was put in place and has been since then. Right now, the Navajo Nation is actually re-examining this moratorium and I am so honored to be a member of one of the working groups that is developing a policy to provide protections um, related to genomic research on the Navajo Nation. Um, but I did want to share uh, this moratorium was put in place because of publications like these where uh, people were studying inbreeding in the Navajo people. They were not, they were studying types of colorectal cancer without having an ethical approach and then uh, studying many blood groups of native folks. Um, but and it's interesting, this study that studied blood groups, they were actually recruiting from boarding schools and all of, in the methods, they were uh, uh, sampling hundreds of Navajo children, probably without the consent of those children. So, so this is sort of giving a little bit more context about where I'm coming from. Um, and as I began my work in this field, I really started to notice this disconnect between genomic and academic research and indigenous communities. Um, this is another example of uh, a tribe, uh, the Havasupai tribe, um, um, a, re-obtaining uh, their samples uh, from Arizona State University in 2010. So I think this has gained a lot of uh, uh, notoriety, but um, just to uh, also highlight that there is this disconnect that I see between um, academia and indigenous communities and one way to um, uh, be create collaborations and become more inclusive. Um, so those are things that I, uh, my lab, I hope does. <laughs> and I'm hoping that it can do. So, um, so this is my lab. Uh, the, uh, we study indigenous genomics and ethics. Um, so I have two primary. I'll go a little bit more into detail into some of these projects, but I, I have two components of my research. One, looking at pharmacogenomic research in diverse populations. The other, thinking about some of the cultural and bioethical issues that arise in genomic research with native populations. So I work with many different tribes across the United States as well as in Canada. I work with my own tribe, the Navajo Nation, uh, developing an um, perspectives, uh, empirical study looking at perspectives of uh, genetic Navajo perspectives on genetic research. Um, but this is uh, what I do, and uh, it's, uh, I try to incorporate my culture and my values in all of my projects and approach them with humility and from a uh, place of deep respect because when I go into communities, they are the knowledge holders. And even though I'm native, I do not, um, I, I, I am not a member of those communities, so I try to come with respect. And even in my own community, I, I make sure to listen to the elders and make sure that they have 
it's a bi-directional learning process. Um, but also in the way I have approached even starting my research lab, I have tried to incorporate my indigenous values into that aspect. So in 2020, when I my research lab, or my space was finally available, um, I was able to bring a tribal member, um, Dr. David Begay, who's also a medicine man. So I asked him to come into my lab space, place, lab space and bless the area. So he did a traditional, and usually with, uh, our culture, any new space that you go into, you want to make sure you cleanse it and um, and make sure that it's a space for learning and uh, respect. And so he was able to do that back when I started my research lab. Um, now um, I have, uh, uh, at least in this picture, four indigenous students who are in my lab right now. Um, and. It's, it's very meaningful that they chose me out of all of the faculty in our university to work with me and I try to make it a very inclusive environment. We have SAGE in our lab and I'm actually learning a lot from my visit here from the Native American house. I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. So <laughs> um, in my lab space, I have uh, Native artists uh, who do uh, really cool artwork on biology and indigenous uh, uh, perspectives in, hanging in my lab space. So I'm trying to make this a space where my scholars and trainees feel comfortable. Um, and a lot of times people don't even realize that they have this, this discomfort until they actually go into a space where they feel completely at ease and can talk science. And I've been in those spaces such as uh, the SING program here. I've gone to SACNAS conferences where you just feel completely uh, comfortable and that's the environment I want to uh, create in my own lab space um, and then also in the in throughout the world actually there has been really um, a lot of thought and advancement made in thinking about community specific research ethics so I try to incorporate a lot of this knowledge from other areas into my own research so uh, Temate Ira has always been something that I keep going back to and so it was uh, guidelines for genomic research with Maori people um, so that has really guided a lot of my research and actually right now um, with the Navajo Nation we are sort of thinking about how do we create this framework for genomic research but with Navajo people and um, it's been really great to work with uh, my community on a lot of these endeavors um, so like I said I was going to get back to my research area uh, so this pharmacogenomic research um, I'll get into this a little more but I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that we're doing um, a lot of the work um, that I'm doing is related to the CYP P450 enzymes. Um, so one of them that I'm really interested in is in CYP2A6, which is uh, responsible for nicotine metabolism. Um, so I'm working with a few tribes um, looking at nicotine metabolism and its relation to smoking cessation and how we can personalize treatment for people who want to quit smoking. Um, tobacco has always been a cultural um, a cultural aspect to many tribes um, and it's important to consider the cultural parts of tobacco in many communities um, since it's used for ceremony as well. Um, the other aspects uh, I'm looking at uh, cytochrome P450 diversity um, in general uh, in uh, and seeing because this has not been done before in many native tribes and then lastly I'm looking at evolutionary farm evolution of pharmacogenes, which I'll touch upon a bit today, um, and then uh, developing some in vitro assays to look at what these variants do in the different community, or in uh, different variants do in a sort of an in vitro system. Um, the, on the bioethical side, um, one of the projects is with the Navajo Nation where we are doing qualitative and survey interview or surveys with uh, the Navajo community to know what are their perspectives. Um, when the moratorium was put in place, people didn't really know, well, what do the Navajo community think? Nobody knew, there was no data on that. So from this project, we were able to find out that from a survey that 
over 65% of people did not even know the moratorium was in place, but people wanted to learn more. And so with this project, we are actually developing genetic literacy materials in the Navajo language and um, um, working with uh, elders to develop that, as well as digital stories to inform the public about what is genomic research and the different aspects. Um, and then uh, some of the work, uh, go, my work goes into looking at the ethics of the use of ancestor uh, samples in research. And then lastly, uh, thinking about the impacts and mentorship of and uh, indigenous trainees. And I'll talk a little bit about the PRIME program at the end of my talk. Let me just make sure, yeah. Um, but today I wanted to really focus on pharmacogenomics. Um, so I'm sure many of you have heard of personalized medicine. Uh, so uh, personalized medicine is an emerging field that combines people's genetic profiles, environments, and lifestyles, and um, tries to use this information for diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of diseases. So pharmacogenomics is the foundation of personalized medicine, and a lot of people have thought that it's the very low-hanging fruit, and, um, but actually there is a lot that goes into pharmacogenomics. Um, implementation is like one of the hardest things that um, is now facing the field, um, but uh, this is what I, my work is related to. Oops. And, a part of this is a lot of different um, initiatives. So like the All of Us is one initiative in the US that is trying to personalize medicine. Um, there are different biobanks that have uh, arisen in the last decade or so where uh, people are able to um, do this in a clinical way where you return results. Um, I'm actually a part of a CCPM as our biobank at Colorado where we are able to actually return pharmacogenomic uh, uh, variant results back to patients, um, as well as other well-known uh, uh, clinically um, functional variant information. Um, so the promise of uh, pharmacogenomic research, um, so the promise is to uh, um, um, ideally guide the selection of the best dose and drug for an individual and minimize adverse side effects. Um, and this gives us the potential to improve health uh, and reduce the cost of care for uh, all people. So, um, so if you were given a general population like this room um, and I prescribed a medication to someone uh, or everyone, then for, most, for the most part, I could treat most of you with the conventional drug or dose. But there are other individuals who will either have a adverse side effect or have no effect, and these are the individuals where you would treat with an alternative drug or dose. So, so often we're finding that a lot of uh, diverse populations are falling into this category but being overlooked or excluded from uh, different clinical um, um, implementation efforts. So like I mentioned, I study the cytochrome P450 enzymes. These enzymes are involved in drug metabolism, um, so this is in figure A, these are all of the enzymes involved in drug metabolism. 75% of these enzymes are CYP P450 enzymes. And of these P450s, um, these top, I think, um, eight genes are involved in a lot of the metabolism of over two, 250 of the typically uh, prescribed medications right now. So very important set of enzymes. And when I'm talking about genetic variation, I'm talking about, uh, so we'll often find uh, single nucleotide variants in many of these enzymes, um, insertion deletions, and um, there are actually quite a few structural variants um, that arise. So here I'm showing the CYP2D6 enzyme, and it has a really, it's one of the most highly variable enzymes in the genome, but it has a, a really interesting copy number variation where with non-homologous recombination, you can get really interesting uh, uh, hybrids, you can get multiple copies of the gene, and as I'll show later, there are some implications that this is related to um, some of the evolution, um, the evolution of farming and agriculture um, still remains to be. Uh, proven, but. <laughs> um, so when I talk about pharmacogenomics, we have sort of nomenclature in pharmacogenomics that uh, they're called star alleles. So if you notice this one, CYP2D6 star 10. Um, so that's uh, the star 
usually refers to a haplotype. So sometimes the haplotype is just one nucleotide change. So this star 10 refers to this specific change, 100 uh, C to T change. This, um, so when something is designated as a star allele, it's off, it often has function. So for this one, uh, it causes an amino acid change and it decreases the enzyme function. So depending on what this enzyme metabolizes, this might affect um, how someone is, uh, what dose someone of medication someone is prescribed. Um, in other instances, these star alleles can refer to a haplotype. Um, so this is star CYP2D6, star 2. It's composed of two nucleotides, one in the uh, three prime area and one in exon, what is that, six? Yeah, exon six. So this creates a uh, two amino acid changes, but um, for this, there's a normal enzyme activity. Um, but in combination with other variants, um, you might have something, or an individual might have reduced or low, or reduced or increased enzyme activities. Um, so just a little background on that. Um, but I did want to sort of talk about some of the evolution of these pharmacogenes. So in humans, there are 57 CYP-P450 enzymes. And this was a really cool study from 2007 that looked at all CYP-P450 enzymes in, uh, I think, 10 different species, um, including humans. And they posited this hypothesis where they um, hypothesized that there was a lot of uh, gene losses and duplications in uh, exogenous um, CYP-P450 enzymes. Um, sometimes these CYP-P450s are exogenous or endogenous or um, interact with exogenous or endogenous substrates. So, so this was a really interesting hypothesis and here I'm just showing um, you'll have to pay attention to the colors but um, the black uh, the black lettering shows that these are endogenous substrates and the blue shows xenobiotic substrates or ex ex exogenous and then these, the red shows under positive selection. So if you notice these two are endo endogenous substrates, there's no positive selection that was detected in looking at these 10 species, but if you look at these other, this cluster here, which is related to CYP2, 3A4 and 3A5, you're, we see a ton of positive selection in uh, different species um, as well. At, so this is a xenobiotic substrate, so something that interacts with the environment. So, so I, this is just a really interesting um, uh, area where it, it seems like the evolution of these gene families in different mammals um, suggests like there's um, with more exogenous substrates, you find this uh, frequent gene losses and deletions. Um, but one possible explanation is that these genes are evolving under positive selection and int thus introducing or introduction of copy number changes and which might have increased the the ability of these species to co-evolve with the environment. So this is something that I'm interested in thinking a little bit more about in the context of why do we see um, some of these variants in um, modern human populations um, and also not even, uh, this isn't even including archaic individuals, but we see some of the same variants in archaic individuals that are shown or are we are finding in modern, anatomically modern human populations. Um, but this is also just a figure showing, I don't know if many people can see it, but showing the, diff the endogenous pathways and exogenous and seeing that um, mo more genes are under positive selection in the exogenous pathways. Um, but this also goes back to thinking about what we see in other species too. I think it's really interesting. Um, the signatures of natural selection have actually been found in several pharmacogenes, uh, mostly these drug metabolizing enzymes um, with specific genetic variants and uh, copy number variation that confers a selective advantage um, to specific environments. So one example is uh, these two genes are actually UGT1 and 2 are found in herbivores and omnivores um, and are, is suggested to be related to the dietary content um, since a lot of these uh, uh, species 
intake uh, plant-derived toxins. So um, it's suggested that this is why these are under evolution, uh, positive selection. Uh, or maybe in birds, the CYP2 gene um, is related to different feeding habits of different birds. Um, and interestingly, this uh, CYP4, CYP4A and 4F um, um, uh, CYP genes are in these Bactri Bactrian camels, um, and this is um, suggested to be related to a camel's ability to intake large amounts of salt um, without developing hypertension. Um, but I think these are really interesting studies that compare different species and um, suggest that there's a relationship between endogenous roles of pharmacoproteins or pharmacogenes and also conserv and their conservation, um, whereas those other enzymes that interact more directly with the environment um, might be more polymorphic and prone to copy number duplications. Um, so in humans, I think it's really interesting, um, and this was the gene I used that as an example earlier, CYP2D6. Um, there is some suggestion that there is co-evolution between pharmacogenes and human lifestyles. Um, so um, these two genes, NAT2 and CYP2D6, um, uh, have been studied in depth in hunter-gatherer populations and food-producing populations, and there they we see more variation uh, um, correlated with positive selection in the um, in uh, between these two separate groups. Um, but there are also other examples. Um, uh, CYP2, CYP3A4 and 5 have been suggested to be related to salt retention in uh, some indigenous communities. And then I think this last one, um, AS3MT, um, so this is a um, uh, enzyme that um, um, metabolizes arsenate methyl, it's arsenate methyl transferase. So, uh, and in Argentine indigenous populations, there are specific variants that help individuals in these areas deal with the arsenic uh, or those toxic substances in their local environment. So, so this has really not been studied very much. Um, um, my colleagues and I published this a couple years ago in which we wanted to see what frequencies of CYP P450 did we find in indigenous communities? And we did a systematic uh, literature review and looked at indigenous populations in North America um, and just looked at what SIP enzymes were studied. So in the US, American Indian and Alaska Native, there were six pharmacogenomic studies. In the indigenous people of Canada, seven studies and in uh, the indigenous populations in Mexico, 14. So this, and some of these studies were only studying one enzyme or two enzymes at most, but um, a lot of the work coming out of the United States was actually studies that were a part of the Northwest um, Alaska uh, Pharmacogenomics Network, which I did my postdoc with. So, so this is not a lot of information, and um, so that is sort of, um, a lot of the motivations for the work that I do in my lab. Um, and interestingly, this is just one example from, uh, so this is the CYP2C19 star 2 allele. It introduces a loss of function. So those enzymes are non-functional in individuals. But when you segregate this across First Nations, uh, American Indian populations, and indigenous Mexican populations, you see quite different frequencies. Um, so anywhere from 19%, there's 31% here. Um, a lot of these differences have to, may have to do with founder effects, uh, isolation uh, between populations. Maybe there are selective pressures that are at play here, or maybe this is due to genetic drift. Um, uh, we're not quite sure why we're seeing such differences, but one thing is quite clear is that we cannot generalize uh, indigenous populations into one group. Um, what this review told us is that we see very different frequencies across, uh, even across the U.S., and um, thus the need to include more native peoples in science as well as uh, uh, participants in some of these uh, studies. And this is important because um, at least pharmacogenomic information is directly clinically ap applicable. So this is just one example from two uh, pharmacogenes, vcor C1 and CYP2C9. Um, 
And this was a uh, uh, two different studies that, or two different cohorts where they wanted to, individuals wanted to use the pharmacogenomic information to guide warfarin dosing. Um, and they have two cohorts here. Um, in the first cohort, the EU PAC, they found a benefit for genotype guided warfarin dosing. But in this other group, COAG, they found no significant difference between the groups. So why were these conflicting results? Um, well, in the COAG group, um, there were 27% um, African American uh, representation. So, so that changes the whole dynamics of these pharmacogenomic algorithms that are informing clinical care. If we don't know about what variants are present in other populations, this algorithm has no use in for some of these patients from these. Uh, background. So, so it's very important that we start to consider the clinical implement implications of pharmacogenomic information. Um, so without having adequate uh, baseline knowledge of variants, um, there's the potential for a phenotypic misclassification. Um, this might uh, continue to contribute to healthcare disparities. Um, and these are just missed opportunities for optimizing care in different communities. Um, so I'm a part of the uh, clinic or Center for Personalized Medicine, so we really try to think about how we can take our data and make it applicable on the clinical side. And um, I'm really interested in promoting this research um, for Native communities' benefits. And I just wanted to mention that going, I'm, we are like here for <laughs> a lot of my work, but we want to be here. Um, so from uh, Im actually impacting clinical care and there have been a lot, there has been a lot of movement in the last couple decades um, in relation to pharmacogenomic research. We have a clinical pharmacogenetics impl implementation consortium uh, we have PharmVar, which um, is a resource where all of these pharmacogenomic variants, um, they, uh, they try to standardize uh, different uh, tests and different um, variants and their function. So there's a lot that we can do at this interface. And that's my, that's my hope. So our center um, recently uh, 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 ran this article, well, recent as in 2021, but, but I thought it was an interesting story. Um, so this patient was uh, someone who opted into the, our biobank and the patient ended up having a pharmacogenetic variant that um, was significant. I think they were, um, it was a medication for uh, citalopram. And so this, the way our clinical implementation works is that um, once this genetic information is put into the electronic health record for this individual, uh, their, whenever their clinician, uh, when they visit the clinic and uh, they need to be prescribed a medicine, this alert pops up that informs the clinician that this person has a specific variant and you shouldn't prescribe them this medication or you should prescribe a lower dose. Um, but this was a really cool story that happened and um, in our biobank. But ideally, that's something that I would like to really uh, implement in native communities, which are often rural, which is another issue. Um, but I think the future of pharmacogenetic research for indigenous peoples is um, uh, quite positive. I think that um, individuals like the Native Bio Data Consortium are leading the efforts to uh, come up with ways to store data and make it um, applicable or put in place the protections that a lot of tribal nations need. Um, also, uh, Dr. Erica Woodall from University of Montana is leading the Precision Medicine Project, which is engaging with rural and urban communities, including uh, native communities, and thinking about how can we implement some of this uh, pharmacogenomic testing in uh, rural populations. And then I, I'm hopeful to make some impact on this field uh, and have been working with different uh, tribal groups across the U.S. to uh, think about ways that we can look at this variation, but also thinking about how we can uh, produce a broader framework for interacting with native communities. Um, so one of the, <laughs> so that's a quick jump. So this is more my research area, uh, but I wanted to sort of uh, uh, talk about 
something that arose out of all of these interactions with tribal communities. Um, um, so this effort led me to creating the PRIME faculty program, uh, or PRIME program, which is, stands for Precision Health and Genomics Indigenous Mentoring and Ethics Program. Uh, so this is a supplement grant to my R35, actually. Um, so it was really a call to action. Um, and I was just noticing, as someone who likes to make connections with other indigenous scholars, there aren't many of us at the who run research programs, and there aren't many of us applying for these larger R01 grants. Uh, in fact, the data says that from 2000 to 2006, there were only 41 total applications from indigenous peoples uh, for R01s, and that's a very low number. Um, so really trying to uh, increase the genomic workforce and represent, or finding a way to sustain people and retain people. Um, and there's a lack of diversity in uh, science and engineering degrees. Uh, I think American Indians and Alaska Natives are always in this little thin strip here, the yellow strip. Um, but uh, so I was able to apply for the supplement, a diversity, equity, and inclusion, an accessibility supplement to mentor indigenous trainees and faculty. So this supplement pays for two indigenous trainees to work in my lab for the entire year. Uh, we are creating a prime seminar series, which is actually hybrid. So if anyone's interested in seeing some of these wonderful speakers, you can uh, zoom in. Um, and then we also have a prime mentoring, faculty mentoring program for uh, early career indigenous faculty. So we, we recently accepted six early career native faculty who have their own research programs, who are working at that intersection of precision health and ethics. Um, and we've had a couple meetings so far, but our, this will sort of culminate in a writing project, uh, hope maybe a grant or manuscript and a writing retreat. and really trying to figure out ways where we can become, be inclusive of the different ways of knowing and um, uh, be inclusive of the different priorities in life. Um, so we encourage our faculty mentees to bring their families actually to our in-person retreat because we're not in silos. Our family is a part of our research and they are um, an important part that we need to consider more. So. So in summary, um, I think that including an indigenous perspective is important in research, whatever research you do. I think that um, we need to be open to new ways of how we can use indigenous knowledge and science in research. Um, and you don't have to be indigenous to think about new ways. Um, and it's sort of becoming a uh, opening yourself to be less biased as a scientist and realize there are other ways. And I think that knowledge processes, they can come in many forms and we have to be open to being interdisciplinary and learning from others. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you um, to my lab members who really drive a lot of the work forward, um, to my administrative team at Colorado who helped me with getting funding and <laughs> making everything happen, and then our, my many collaborators uh, from the PJRN, from Singh, uh, the tribal communities that I'm working with now, and also my research collaborations and, um, and my funders. And thank you so much to everyone for coming today and for the invitation. I'm happy to answer questions. Oh yes, this is my my house back home on the res. <laughs> Questions for Akita. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for that great talk. Um, my question has to do with the um, patterns of variation in the P450 genes that you mm -hmm. study. Are there good phylogeny of indigenous populations in North America to help understand um, those relationships better? Um, I there are. Phylogenies, there, right now, a lot of the work has um, really pertained to mitochondrial DNA, which only tells one side of the story, or Y chromosomes. Um, there hasn't been a lot of um, autosomal um, uh, studies in looking at this, and in part, of, in part due to uh, tribes not wanting to participate in many of these studies without knowing what's going to happen to their data in the future. Um, so I think that there's definitely a lot more work that could be done at that, on that forefront. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, definitely. So the question was about epigenetics and other inhibitors. Uh, definitely, there's a whole field of research related to uh, interaction, drug gene interact, or drug drug interaction. So. Um, there's a reason why you can't drink grapefruit juice with certain medications because it inactivates them. Um, but one of the projects uh, with that I'm looking at um, related to nicotine metabolism, actually we are uh, going to move forward with doing an epigenome-wide association study um, on nicotine metabolism. Um, there, ha there has been some work, but it's been inconsistent in different Eth ethnic populations and no one has studied indigenous populations so that's sort of that's a great future direction that I want to uh, look at in the in relation to CYP2A6 to but definitely I think that a lot of other genes since there is this deep environmental component and uh, related to diet and um, whatever's in the environment I think that's definitely a future direction that a lot of folks are thinking about mm -hmm. So uh, indigenous populations, um, reactions to smoking cessation. So overall, just from uh, if people are trying to quit smoking, the rates are horrible. <laughs> uh, so if, you're, if you quit smoking for six months, that's great. Uh, and for a year, that's, uh, that's, it's really common to, for folks to relapse. But when we look at indigenous populations, there hasn't, there, there are some studies that look at this, but it's very, it, it does vary because there is heterogeneity in the prevalence of smoking. So actually in the Southwest, we don't really have a culture of incorporating tobacco into our ceremonies. So there's not actually a high uh, prevalence of smoking, but when you look at like the Plains or in Alaska, they have some of the highest prevalence in smoking. So I think, the, from 2020, the data said about 50% of the population smoked, but, but also there's heterogeneity in how much people smoke. Um, a lot of, even though there's high prevalence, some people might smoke one or two cigarettes uh, as opposed to the more general population. I think the numbers are about 20 cigarettes per day if someone says they're a smoker. Um, so they're quite different. And for smoking cessation, um, there are typically two different types of treatments. Um, one is like the nicotine patch that people are familiar with. Another is sort of varenicline, which is a different, it goes through a different um, pathway. So, and what we're finding is that if you're a slow metabolizer or a fast metabolizer of nicotine, you should be prescribed different smoking cessation aids. So if you're a rapid metabolizer, varenicline actually works much better for those individuals than um, the, the nicotine patch, but also when you're working with tribal communities, there is uh, there are different perceptions about how what tobacco means in the culture. I don't know if if peop and in Alaska we were able to explore this a bit with the community there at South Central Foundation, um, where we interviewed people about their what they think about smoking cessation and the use of pharmacogenetic testing. Um, I think a lot of folks thought that. It would be great, but they also needed to make sure that they had culturally appropriate smoking cessation uh, programs, and in addition to the uh, medical me medicinal treatment that they received. So, yeah, definitely varies by location. Jenny. Um, <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, not in pharmacogenomics. I know that in broader genomics fields, people have been looking at language maps and genomic maps and uh, thinking about those correlations. I think that um, since the pharmacogenomic data is so sparse, um, we can't really do that now. But I think we acknowledge that if we're, well, at least I do, um, in Alaska there are some um, some overlap with southwestern tribes, so <clears throat> um, we do take that into consideration. But I think it also goes back to this broader issue of um, uh, what type of descriptor is being used, because in some genomic studies, people refer to like uh, the broad continental groups, or others are very specific and uh, refer to tribal groups, or others refer to language groups. It just because there are plenty of pa papers that refer to Athabascan genetic variation, but it's a language group. So, so I think that the field needs to uh, become a little bit better about. Uh, how they describe people and how all of this is put together in publications. Mm -hmm. Have you found any connections between ancient DNA and topics in pharmacogenomics? Ah, so ancient DNA and uh, pharmacogenomics. So this is a fun project that uh, Ripon and I have been collaborating on, but we did look at archaic um, DNA uh, in the pharmacogenomic variation in archaic DNA, so from Neanderthals and Denisovan individuals. Um, so there are four high coverage genomes. Um, so we saw, we saw some really interesting variation, some that was shared with modern human populations today, and potentially, um, and we also were able to look at which uh, variants from archaic individuals are shared with, are there variants specific to uh, specific populations, so we were able to find some variants that were only in, found in indigenous populations and others that were found in um, other populations from around the world. So um, we're trying to get it published, <laughs> but you can find our paper in bioarchives. Um, so that, that's been a really fun project that we've been able to do, but uh, some of the variants that we see, they're that we see the same variants in Neanderthal individuals, and I don't know if it's shared or maybe that's a hot spot for recombination, but I, I think it's really interesting. So <laughs> I didn't, but I think from genomics, like pop gen um, courses, that we know that the shared shared variation across uh, human populations is um, um, quite high. There's not a lot of within population uh, variation, um, but <laughs> I'm trying to remember how you word this. But yeah, there are other studies that do that. I haven't done that in pharmacogenomics uh, specifically. But yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, thinking about how the descriptions we use to group people are so um, varied in the publications, and like how much diversity we see between tribal groups across the U.S. Um, how do we go about asking for diversifying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question and one that um, I'm, there's actually a National Academies Committee that is actually pursuing this very question. I'm, I'm a part of that committee, but we will be releasing our, um, our sort of findings from that report um, next week, I believe, <laughs> on the 15th. But we are specifically looking at genomic population descriptors and how they have been used um, in the past uh, um, to promote racism and um, how we can move forward in the future. Unfortunately, I can't really go into the report now, but I think that, and a lot of other places have come out with publications on how to either 
I don't know if standardized is the right word because uh, it that's something we I, I think we want to make sure that there are there's enough um, flexibility where um, if we involved a tribal community we would go with what descriptors they preferred and that was meaningful for them so in my research it varies because um, I've been in research studies where the tribe is fine saying their tribal name others where they prefer regional names so southwest x of the state um, so it it does vary but it is also important to consider what this means for the community if the community can use this data and uh, promote different policies, I think that's important to consider too. But it always goes back to the community and what they prefer. Um, but unfortunately, once the data, if it's openly shared, a lot of that community preference and narrative gets distorted or lost. And so I think that other groups uh, are thinking about how to keep these labels on them so that other people know that this isn't just uh, Amerindian samples these are actually tribal members from this area and they prefer this to be a part of the any future uh, research okay. thank you